set your seat in its upright position, and uh, buckle up because you're about to experience the funniest Bible study in the history of the universe. Greg Perry, the most interesting author in the world, unleashes rip splitting insight from the most important book ever written. While Perry is the masculine theologian, he's also joyful, gleeful, playful, grateful, whimsical, and always biblical. Here you get the Super Bowl of Bible study, the Stradivarius of podcast, and the Armageddon of truth. And while you're laughing, <laughs> he may just scare you off the path to hell. And here's the man you are waiting for. Well, it's his podcast after all. Greg Perry. Yeah, the train ride of truth tracking toward you. I am your ever-loving host, Greg Perry, with Dexter. He's my sound guy. We're back with another podcast. Broadcast, Gregcast, Godcast. Reminding you that every episode broadcasts in a 100% completely judgment-free zone. We ask that you honor our request for a judgment-free zone by never charging money when you judge others. And we promise that if we ever judge you or anyone else, we will never charge you money to judge and rebuke you. Judgment-free, rebuke-free, all the time. In last week's Part 1 episode, and you really need to listen to it if you haven't already, Podcast 7 of our national rollout, we began a study of great big words, and we ended up discussing a cursory introduction, although no cursing occurred, to hermeneutics. Do you remember what the word hermeneutics means? That means interpretation, and the term is almost always used for interpreting God's Word. Wow, podcast number eight. Did you know that most podcasts end after the seventh episode on the average? So we've beat the odds. By the way, I was going to talk about something else today. I was going to do a teaching on the Good Samaritan. You've heard of that, right? The Good Samaritan? But I realized... I hate all those Japanese movies, so we'll save all that talk about Samaritans for another time. So let's continue with hermeneutics, which requires that we discuss Bible translations first, and only after understanding the translator's challenges can you understand the importance of this thing we're calling hermeneutics, or Hermann Munster hermeneutics. Why talk about Bible translations? Well, is your Bible the best one you could be using? If it is, why? Now, I don't mean the Holy Bible. I mean, is your Bible translation the best one you can be using? Do you use a King James or an NASB or an NIV or English Standard Version? Or what do you use? I think you should understand why you use the translation that you use. If it's because your parents used it, that probably is not your best reason to be using the Bible that you use. Now, if your parents were God-fearing people who understood Bibles and how they came about and how our English translations occurred and they researched and understood that maybe the one that they used was the best one that they could be using, that that's a whole other story, but that rarely happens. Most people just pick up a Bible or they pick one that their parents used or they pick one that their pastor suggests. Now, if you have a good pastor, well, there's a lot of reason to go with what he suggests, but you should know something about your Bible. There are several. There are lots of English. There are several English Bibles, and there are there are so many. You really should understand why there are so many. And it all boils down to hermeneutics, or interpretation and translation. So, you know the old joke, well, if the King James Bible was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Anyway, which King James? If you use a King James, do you use the original one coming out in the 1600s, or do you use the one that is uh, changed quite a bit from that, that they publish today. You should know the answers as to why you use the version you use. Now, it's important to know that two ways exist to translate writing from one language to another language, and that's what we're doing. You know, God inspired writers of the Old Testament to write down his words in Hebrew, and he inspired the New Testament authors to write in mostly Greek. We have an English Bible. If you don't know Hebrew or ancient Greek, we use an English version today. And two ways exist to translate one version to another. A literal 
word-for-word -word translation, or a paraphrase, or interpreting the meaning of the writer in the first language and then writing that meaning in the language that you're translating to. The challenge for those of us who speak English is to take that original Hebrew and those Greek manuscripts that we have, or that they have, you know, and all the museums and the Bible scholars have, and translate them into English. And in doing so, we know we cannot translate one language exactly, perfectly into another. That's just something that we have to face. Translators always make decision after decision when they translate. Think about it. If everybody agreed, there would only be one English Bible. But there are tons of them. They all differ. So why not just take every word written in Hebrew and convert each word to its English equivalent and you have a perfect literal translation, right? Wrong. Greek and Hebrew form sentences and paragraphs much differently from the way we do in English. So a literal word-for-word -word translation often is not understandable to us. Let me take a simple example. Exodus 3.13. Now, I just chose the NASB for the following. Exodus 3, 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? That's understandable. Moses is asking God, Look, these, these guys, these Hebrews, they're going to ask me what, you're call, what, what I'm supposed to call you. What, what's your name? What, what am I supposed to say when they want to know your name? I don't know why Moses thought they would ask, but anyway, it was a good question, actually, it turned out. Now, if you want to hear that in the King James, it's also understandable. Of course, it's in English. It reads in the King James, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? When they ask me his name, when they ask me your name, what am I supposed to say? Now, both the King James and the NASB are said to be literal translations. Now, that means the translators took every single word in the original Hebrew and attempted to translate each word literally into English. Easy peasy, right? No. The original Hebrew is not understandable to us when they literally do a literal word-for-word -word translation. Here is the Hebrew Bible's passage from the Lexham Hebrew English Interlinear for those who care. Each word, in the order it appears in the original Hebrew for Exodus 3.13, says this, And say Moses to the God, Look, I go, God, to they, and say Israel, to child, to you, send, I father, you to they, say what, what, name, he, and say to I. What? Yeah, that's it. That is a literal word-for-word -word translation, taking the exact Hebrew words in the order they appear and translating them to English. Clear as mud, right? You see the structure of Hebrew words and phrases and sentences. that We can't apply those to English word-for-word. -word. So, literal translations do attempt to do a word-for-word -word translation, but they must look at each Hebrew verse, not just the words, and figure out what it literally says, word for word, and then attempt to rearrange that literal translation into English sentences that say the same thing. This isn't easy. I mean, even the literal translations, those translators doing the literal translations must make some assumptions, and yes, they actually sometimes must make some guesses. Now, most of them are very educated, so they make educated guesses, which is a reasonable thing to do. But that is why every what we call literal translation, such as the New King James Bible or the NASB, that's why they don't say exactly the same English words. Those translators had to make some assumptions, and they differed with each other. So, okay, okay, okay. Some of you are chomping at the bit to, well, at best tell me and at worst yell at me that I'm not taking the majority and the minority texts into consideration here as far as talking about Bible translations. Stop yelling at me. I, I, I hear you. I know, you're, I know I'm not talking about the majority and minority texts and all of that. I just don't want to add yet another layer to this discussion. So if you don't know anything about minority minor, and majority texts, that's fine. You should probably put it on your to-do list to learn something about. But for right now, yes, the original texts, the codices or codexes as the, both plural forms are used, all of that plays a role in making one translation different from another. But even so, that in no way changes anything I'm saying here, as I keep 
extra layers of this translating and hermeneutic onion from being peeled off for you. So translators, yes, they must sometimes actually guess what the original manuscript says before they can translate some of the original manuscripts into English. Now, I prefer literal translations over the other kind of Bible translation, because if done properly, the literal translators guess less than paraphrased translators. There are two types of translations, literal word-for-word -word and paraphrased. Both have to do some guessing, but the literal translators guess less as to what God inspired the Greek and Hebrew writers to write. Now, how, go how good are you at guessing what God has to say? Are you pretty good at that? Huh. Most people, actually all people, are horrible at guessing what God has to say. But why would you? Why would you ever guess? He gave us an entire book of what he wanted us to know. But that book that he inspired was inspired in languages that are not our languages for the most part. He inspired the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament, mostly in Greek, some Aramaic. And it's not even Greek as we know Greek to be today. It's Greek used called Koine Greek, which differs from the Greek spoken today in Greece. God used Koine Greek because it was the common language spoken by more people than Latin, for instance. God always wants as many people to know about what he has to say as possible, so he used the language of the people. He inspired his writers of the New Testament to use the common language of the people so they would know what he was having to say. God is the great communicator. He doesn't want his word to be hard to understand. He wants it to be easy. Now, he didn't choose a common Hebrew language. We don't say that because it's been fairly consistent for 4,000 years or more. He used Hebrew, that everybody who knew Hebrew knew and spoke, and most people today who know Hebrew understand it just fine. Now, can I ask you a favor? I mean, I'm sure you'll oblige me. After all I've done for you, I'd like to begin saying Hebrew Bible and Greek Bible instead of Old Testament and New Testament. Now, that's going to be difficult throughout the rest of these podcasts to say Hebrew Bible when I'm in the Old Testament because a lot of people will tune in midway and have no idea what I'm talking about. They're going to think I have some odd, strange Bible or that I'm actually reading from the Hebrew and Greek or something. Now, referring to them that way, referring to the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament as the Greek Bible, it eliminates actually some theological pickiness that can arise over the use of the terms Old Testament and New Testament. That's not wrong to use Old Testament and New Testament. We all know what we mean, and that's fine, and I'll probably continue saying that a lot. But by saying Hebrew Bible, I literally mean what we know as the Old Testament that was inspired in the Hebrew language, even though we read the English equivalent, most of us. By saying Greek Bible, I literally mean the Bible we know, the, the, the part of the Bible that we know as the New Testament, which was almost always written in Greek, you know, that street Greek or Koine Greek of the day. So little appeared in Aramaic, not enough to even worry about that, really. We can say Greek Bible, and most of the New Testament was written in Greek, inspired and written down in Greek. Now, I'm sure out of habit, I, again, I'll often say Older New Testament. But you'll know what I mean from now on. It'll be like it'll be like you're in this exclusive secret club, you know, and only some of us have access to the front door. That's really cool. We used our decoder rings to get in. So when I say Greek Bible or Hebrew Bible, you'll know I'm talking about the Greek Bible means New Testament. Or was I? Oh, yeah. Believe it or not, translating the Bible from one of its original language is quite a challenge. I mean, why can't we just translate it using a language dictionary, which is often called a lexicon? Well, it's because there's not one language on earth today, or that ever existed before today, that can be translated literally into another language and still retain 100% of the meaning of the original writer. You get that? There's no way to translate one language to another exactly and retain all meanings. Languages have their own forms and words and idioms and things like that. We all seem to have a grasp at some level of language translation, even if you don't speak a foreign language. You know that to understand some language that you don't know, it has to be translated. Before that translation can occur, one must interpret the words before one can translate the words, and that's why we've started a study about proper hermeneutics. And remember, hermeneutics means interpretation. So even though I'm discussing translation at the moment, translators use various forms of interpretation or hermeneutics before they can translate anything. So all this talk about translation actually is included in the overall blanket of hermeneutics, kind of a subset. Now even translators, they would say hermeneutics is a subset of what they do, but even romance languages that are extremely close, such as Mexican and Italian, it is called Mexican, right? 
Yeah, and Dexter said, he's my sound guy. Dexter said, si, senor. So, Mexican and Italian, those are extremely close languages. Perhaps the two closest languages in use today. Okay? Mexican and <laughs> Italian are the two closest languages in the modern world. I, I believe I can state that with a lot of certainty, actually. And yet, each one has its own idioms and syntax systems that are unique and that make an exact translation impossible 100% of the time. So you can't just take a sentence in Italian and translate it word for word into, what is it again? Oh yeah, Mexican. And the Mexicans can understand it. You just can't do that. You can sometimes, but not every time. Often you can't. The syntax, the idioms, all of that differ. Oh yeah, by the way, for public school English, English teachers listening, a language is syntax. That's not some government tax on booze and cigarettes. The syntax we're talking about here refer to rules or arrangements of spellings and punctuations and phrases in a language. Just just ask a 12 or 13 year old home educated student if you need more help with grammar. They'll help you. So back to translations. When you translate literally, you have to take the original Hebrew or Greek word and convert it to English or whatever the tar target language is. The advantage is you don't have to guess at anything when you translate literally. Well, we already learned. You have to guess less. Remember, no two languages correspond perfectly, so you always have to make some educated guesses about the original intent and words unless the author himself knows both languages and sits next to you telling you both versions. But even that has problems, but we won't go into that. And yes, 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 I know. God speaks to us in a small, still voice. So we know everything because... God tells us in a small, still voice, right? Actually, does he do that? If you get a nudge from God, it's, it's going to be from the Holy Spirit. Did you know that we get the idea of God speaking to us in a small, still voice from 1 Kings 19.12 when God gives Elijah direct instructions? Now, can I say there are a lot of application problems in using that verse? to us today for God actually speaking to us in a small, still voice to our lives today? The Holy Spirit certainly is leading and guiding and even nudging those of us in the body of Christ today, but God the Father is not speaking to us. God the Father literally did speak to Elijah in a still, small voice in 1 Kings, though. I mean, he never, God never uses that phrase ever again. You'd think it's all throughout the Bible the way Christians go around saying it about 19 times a day. And I'm fairly certain we probably shouldn't use it a lot either. Now, I'm being a little picky here, but I'm demonstrating some hermeneutics by doing it. I don't want to take away from the fact that God deals with people differently today from the way he dealt with the Hebrews then. But at the same time, we have Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, all of that between First Kings and now. Paul, the, the chief of sinners, how do we know he was the chief of sinners? Well, he told us that. Paul, the chief sinner, he got saved between 1 Kings and now. The ministry to us in the body of Christ was given to Paul between 1 Kings and now. We've talked about that already on other podcasts. So I just want to be fairly consistent about using phrases God used. I want to be accurate. God the Father, Yahweh, spoke to Elijah. Literally talked to Elijah. Does he literally talk to us today? You hear people say he does. You hear people say he actually spoke to them. Does he? Can we get that from scripture that he does that today? He certainly can do anything he wants to do. Who knows? Maybe he has spoken to you. But let me tell you something. This is a piece of advice. Let me give you the only way you know for certain that God is speaking directly to you. Take your Bible and open them. Open it. Open your Bible to anywhere. I don't care where. And start reading your Bible aloud. That is God speaking. If you think he ever does it any other way today, I mean directly speaking to you, you might be wrong. I'm not saying you are wrong, but you'd better be right because God wanted false prophets stoned for thousands of years and he might just bring that back if enough of you keep on with your false prophecies. So we don't want any Jonathan Cons. Or, I'm sorry, I mean false prophets. I need to correct that. I mean, we don't want any John Hagee. Wait, I mean... We don't want any false prophets. Instead of getting a direct speech from God, you very well may have nothing but a deceiver in your receiver. So, paraphrased Bibles, the other kind, the kind that are not attempted to take words literally and translating them into another language. Major guessing is what the paraphrased Bibles, and I use that term 
Bible use loosely, which angers people. For example, the NIV, the what New International Version, that's the most popular meaning-for-meaning meaning or paraphrased translation. The NIV translators supposedly do the following. They don't just look at words. They try to discern exactly what God meant when he inspired a verse. They, they then don't get too concerned about the words. They don't get too concerned about the original words at all. They just try to write the best English equivalent possible. That means the same thing that they guess the verse means. Do you get it? Now, although most of the Bible is actually clear and easy to understand, most of it is. We're going to learn next week how much. Some of the Bible isn't extremely clear. Very little, actually. But the NIV translators make a lot of assumptions and they guess a lot at meanings. Now, I know I'm sort of denying them the benefit of the doubt that I keep saying they guess at God's meaning, but there's just no other way to describe it. And get this, it's the NIV publishers who want to make a gender-neutral uh, book. I won't even call it a Bible. Gender-neutral, where male and female aren't distinguished. So God as Father is never mentioned. I, I guess they want God the parent to be written instead. That, That is sick. That's exactly why friends of mine in Colorado call the NIV translation the HIV translation. It's something you should stay away from. Run away, run away. Now you have a background necessary for understanding why various translations exist. You know the two approaches. Literal, word for word, which isn't literally literal due to sentence structure differences, syntax between languages. And there's the paraphrased meaning translations where translators make assumptions about meanings. And then they write down what the meaning says, whether the literal words are close or not. So what does all this have to do with hermeneutics? Everything. We're readers of the Bible. We do the very same thing. Only we read an English translation and then we decide whether to guess at the meaning or take it literally. Now, we finally move into what is traditionally known as hermeneutics. The portion of this teaching this week, and I'll warn you, we're going to be covering it next week too. This is a three-parter, but you get three times your money's worth from me, Buster. But I do promise we'll wrap it up next week. It's extremely important to me that I covered hermeneutics early in this National Podcasts episodes. I need you to understand. We can't just pick up any Bible, read it anyway, and get the same thing from it. I mean, if that happened, there wouldn't be denominations in churches. We'd all agree on doctrine. We'd all agree, for example, on water baptism. It'd all be so nice. But our hermeneutical approach to every word in the Bible we read determines what we believe. And even though I keep saying hermeneutics, keep in mind that just means interpretation. That's, that's basically the Greek word, the Koine Greek word for interpretation. All of this centers on the following important topic. How do we interpret what we read in God's book? That is critical. That is really all that matters. When you read God's word, if you do, and if you don't, shame on you, you're going to learn from this podcast. It's so much fun to read the Bible. It is fun. Yes, it's holy. Yes, it is convicting. Yes, it is judgy. Yes, it is rebuking. Yes, it makes us rethink everything in our lives. But it's all for the glory of God, and it is a lot of fun. All of this talk about hermeneutics centers on how do we interpret what we read when we read God's Bible. Because if I interpret something differently from you, we won't have an agreement on that passage. If we don't have an agreement, we will not have full harmony. For those of you who don't know anything about hermeneutics and have never heard any of this before and really haven't cared, that's one reason why there are disagreements between churches. People just do not understand these topics and they don't know the best ways to interpret their Bible. Do I know the best way? Well, yeah. Huh. Now, if I if there's a better way, I want to know what it is, okay? If the way I end up telling you is best, I do believe it's the best, or I'd use something else. So, of course, I think I'm right. It's foolish to think I'm not. But I've been wrong hundreds of times in my life, thousands of times in my life. Well, when it comes to the Bible... I've been wrong a lot. I have grown in God's Word the more that I study and read it. Are there things I have wrong about God's Word? Well, surely there are. I just don't know what they are, or I would want to correct them. So, I do believe I know the best way to read your Bible, to interpret how you read your Bible. I do think I know the best way. And I do think the best Bible to get is a literal translation. So, you should get a King James, New King James, or... Um, NASB or ESV, you should get one of those. And for all the King James only people, they're angry with me right now. So if you're going to listen to them, get a King James version. That's fine. 
the best Bible version to have in your hands is, I started to say any Bible, but I don't know. Boy, some of those NIV Bibles are sure dangerous and just wicked. So the best Bible to have in your hands is a literal translation. And yes, until I learn differently, I'm going to tell you that is the truth. I am correct. Because if I knew I was wrong, I'd tell you something else that's correct. So why do we have so many disagreements? If I interpret something differently from you, we won't have an agreement on that passage. We won't have harmony. That disagreement may or may not be serious, or it may divide entire churches and create new entire denominations. Why do we have so many denominations? Because we don't interpret the Bible the same way. And I'll add, many Christians today don't read or have a clue what's in the Bible anyway. So, you know, the, the, the question, how do we interpret Scripture, often isn't even an issue. It's the sin issue of not caring enough about God to find out what he told us in his book. I'm going to preview next week. Think about how so many people quote Numbers 23.19. Numbers 23.19. You know the one that goes, God is not a man that he should repent. God is not a man that he shall repent. I'm, I am just paraphrasing that, I hate to say. But everyone knows that verse. God is not a man that he should repent. Now think about how so many people quote that. Some people read that and think it's the only verse in the Bible that's important. You've got to trust me on this if you don't know anything about this. Some people think that's the most important verse in the Bible that God doesn't repent. Other people read it and say it doesn't mean what people think it means. Now, how can we be so different on the same simple verse? Well, it's our interpretation method. If you assume it's not meant literally, then you can say, well, it's only meant figuratively. That God, of course, never repents as man does. If you assume it's literal, then you've got to wrestle with other verses that say God does repent. Now, although far more verses exist that say God repents or that God changes his mind than those that say he doesn't repent, Both sides need to understand that this one single verse does not mean two opposite things. God never means two opposite things when he inspires a sentence. We must adopt a hermeneutic, a consistent method of interpretation. We really should understand our translations should be similar, at least literal ones, to help us understand the only goal of our Bible reading, and that is understanding what God wants us to know. Now, one good way to begin interpreting a verse One hermeneutic is to, one part of a hermeneutic is to ask, who's speaking? That's a good question to ask. Now, there's a lot more to hermeneutics, but let's just go with that for now. A guy named Balaam is saying that God isn't like a a man and that he repents. So Balaam, this guy named Balaam, that's a weird name, isn't it? This guy named Balaam is saying that God doesn't repent. Now, that's who is speaking. That's Balaam. Now, who is Balaam? Altogether now, who is Balaam? A false prophet. Balaam, a false prophet prophet tells us God doesn't repent. Wow. Whether you can gleam from elsewhere that God repents, or if you gleam from elsewhere that God never repents, whatever side you take, you really don't want to use this verse to pin your belief on. Do I mean, do you like going around quoting a false prophet? Stop using this verse as one of your proof texts. As a matter of fact, this verse might be the very worst proof text you can find. So if you're on the side of God never repents, Okay, I'm sure you can justify it. I'm sure you've got proof texts. This is not a good one. So use another one. Stop using this one. Stop quoting a false prophet. Anyway, Bible interpretation goes far beyond language translation, as you can see. Literal, figurative translations, and so on. So let me summarize. One, if we could each read and write the Hebrew language as well as English, we'd each produce a different translation if somebody hired us to translate the Hebrew Bible into English. Two, even when we agree that we'll both translate literally word for word, the English sentence structure vastly different differs from Hebrew and Greek, so we still have we still each have to guess somewhat on how to translate, and we're still each producing a different translation ultimately. Hopefully they're similar. By the way, the vast majority of Bibles agree with each other. Okay, the vast majority of let's just take the literal Bible translations. Most of them agree. Now, the purists they're, they're really seething, chomping at the bit right now because I'm not making this a big deal. There are some critical verses that differ between the literal translations. I fully agree. But the problem is, don't, don't act like most Bibles differ most places because they really don't. They really don't if you're honest. We are producing different translations. And this disagreement among paraphrased meaning translations, that's what makes the paraphrased translation so dangerous in my not-so-humble opinion. You really should stay away from paraphrased Bibles like 
the NIV. Uh, I think there's one called The Message and all of that. Now, if you get a book like one of the paraphrased Bibles, I, I would just flee from anything NIV. But anything else that's called a paraphrased Bible, you can read it like a book. That's fine. You can read it like a, a, a historical novel. Well, it's going to be more true than, than false. It's going to be more fact than fiction. But you must understand that is not the literal inspired word of God. You must read it with that in mind. You can get some great things out of it, perhaps. Many people have. People have been saved because of paraphrased Bibles. They've, they've read those. That's fine, but it's not the literal God's Word. Now, neither are the literal translations, but they're attempting to be literally God's Word from the original Hebrew or Greek. So, understanding hermeneutics? Yeah, it's important. We actually can almost wipe away differences between believers. That's really critical. If we have harmony, if we agree on the same hermeneutic, if we agree that the English Bible that we use is a good translation, then we agree that we'll both use the very same method to interpret what we read in the English Bible. If we do that, if we agree on the translation or the translation method, and then we agree that we're going to read the English translation using the same interpretation tools that we have, the same hermeneutics, we will end up with extremely close results from those passages that we read. And we often, I'm talking about the vast majority of time, will come to the same conclusion about God's Word. Our harmony, our differences, our unity is, is important in the body of Christ. So it's not that someone should agree with you because that's the way you read it. It's not that you should agree with them because being united is more important than anything else. That's hogwash. Being correct is important. That's more important than anything else when you're talking about God's Word. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all begin concluding the same thing from God's Word for a change? And I'm talking about Christians with a capital C, true believers, reading our Bibles and agreeing on what it says. What more could we hope for? So, why don't we? Well, we don't do that because of the reality that we don't use the same hermeneutic. Any more than the translators use the same exact translating hermeneutical methods. But until we interpret the Bible the same way, we won't fully agree on the Bible. We'll have a lot of disagreements. So it's my job to tell you about various ways to interpret the English you read. I'll tell you the best one. It's because it's what I use. And if you just do what I say, hey, you'll always be right, right? Listen, I think we can all agree that if I were on the Supreme Court, there'd be no need for eight more judges. Now, let me, let me close with a hermeneutical problem that Janie, my wife, Janie and I faced in one of our first trips to Italy. We were walking along the streets of Bologna, Italy, or as they say in Oklahoma, Bologna, Italy. You've heard about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? Well, Bologna, Italy, it has two Leaning Towers, the Torre dei Ossinelli and the Torre Gerasendi. I just know those by heart. Isn't that amazing? I don't know Bible verses I should know, but I know stupid things like that. Bologna and all of Italy used to be attacked a lot. And rich families, they'd build and they'd live in these tall towers to make it real hard for all the looters to break into their houses and steal from them. And most of these tall towers over time, they were knocked down by raiding armies eventually, or they simply decayed. But some of these ancient towers are still standing, but they lean after hundreds of years because of shifting earth and perhaps faulty engineering, but they did the job they were designed to do at the time. Now, these two towers in Bologna, they're right next to each other. And although the wealthy families who built them, oh, about the 12th century, the, Garadindi, the Garasindis and the Asinelli family, they weren't too fond of each other. They didn't. These two families kind of lived next to each other. They didn't really like each other. But if one tower was breached by some invading outside force, they were close enough that the invading tower's family, they'd put this long plank across to the other tower to cross over to get into safety of the, of the other family's tower. Sort of like, you know, one of those, an enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. Now, that's pretty cool history, isn't it? So, all of this, what do the two leaning towers of Bologna, Italy, have to do with language interpretation? Well, nothing. But I'm getting to the part where it does. So, one evening, Janie and I, we'd climbed one of the towers and enjoyed looking over the city of Bologna. We were walking to a restaurant. Bologna, Italy, it's known as the gastronomical capital of Italy, and therefore the gastronomical capital of the world. The best food in the world is in that region. And we were looking for a non-tourist Italian restaurant. Well, they're all Italian restaurants over there, but, you know, a non-tourist restaurant. Family-owned, that's that's known as a trattoria, tra trattoria in Italian, trattoria. That's like a family-owned restaurant. And one of our goals when we're over there is to always find a trattoria that has no English menus. 
it wouldn't have dropped any standards for tourists. You know, we knew it should be good if they didn't speak any English and if they didn't have any English menus for tourists. We knew we knew that it should be pretty good. Now we've taken we took had at that time taken several years of Italian, so being that it was all Italian wasn't a big concern of ours. But we couldn't find the trattoria that we were looking for, and this lady came along. <laughs> Walking along, it was a fairly empty street. We were walking down in the evening, and we stopped her, and using the best Italian we could muster, we asked her where this specific trattoria was. And she came back with some fast something Italian, kind of, and we could just pick out a few words, but we didn't know what she was saying. So we tried several times, you know, back and forth. We'd communicate and ask her to slow down, and she'd say something to us, and we kind of got a word or two, but she couldn't really understand us, and we couldn't understand her. I mean, talk about a hermeneutical breakdown. Both of us were speaking Italian, and in my opinion, (laughs) we were speaking it far better, but what did I know? You know, I was an American. So anyway, we all three realized that somehow it just wasn't meant to be, so we weren't interpreting each other well enough to continue this attempt. You see, we were both using different hermeneutics, different lots of things. Janie and I would convert our thoughts in English into speaking Italian, and and she just didn't get it. So I looked at Jane and said, resigned. (laughs) We just can't understand each other here. Let's just keep on walking. And the lady's eyes got really big. And in the most perfect American English you'll ever hear in your life, she said, you're Americans too? Ha! What bad hermeneutics we had. And when you use bad hermeneutics, bad interpretation. And when the underlying words and assumptions are bad to begin with, like the NIV Bible does. Oh, I mean, like her lousy Italian was. Nobody's ever going to understand each other. She was, I think, from Texas. And she she and her husband were back at the hotel. They were in Italy for a vacation just like we were. Now, that is a perfect example of two interpreters of the same to and from language. English to Italian. She knew English. She thought she knew Italian. We knew English. We knew a lot more Italian than she did. Coming from two completely different resulting sentences. So this is why I chose the title that several people are angry at. Herman Munster Hermeneutics for this series. First of all, I chose it because it's funny. So you know, if you don't like it, get your own podcast, sister. But also the way we interpret scripture using faulty interpretation tools or hermeneutics. They're all over the place. Let me remind you that every time you read just one verse in the Bible, You're employing hermeneutics. Get it? You use, often, Herman Munster hermeneutics when you read your Bible, and it's my job to bring life back into your Herman Munster, or Frankenstein-like monstrous Bible interpretation, (laughs) so you can enjoy and understand God's Word and apply it in your daily walk. That's my goal. That's why I harp on you so much. My goal, well, actually, it's God's job to put life into anything, including your Bible reading. He's the author of life. But next week, I'm going to tell you the best hermeneutics to use, the very best way to interpret your Bible. And there is one way, and I'm serious about this. I will tell you the best way to interpret your Bible. That means when you read your Bible, how do you think it through? How do you read it and go, this is what that means? I am going to tell you the best way. I'm pretty serious about this. It is the best way. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, it must be the best way because you use it. And of course you're right. (laughs) But no, be here or be square for podcast number nine, Herman Munster Hermeneutics, concluding with part three. But as a wrap up, I want to thank Dexter. He's my sound guy. We want you to keep in mind that someday we'll be going on eternity leave. Now, when I do, you won't have me to kick around anymore, Buster. But you'll be going on eternity leave as well, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But until you do, you have full control over the thermostat when you arrive. You can either order excruciatingly hot or perfect. And let me remind you that stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell. You've just been attacked with a force field of truth. Remember, if you're ever unsatisfied with anything we say, you may mail back the unused portion and will gladly say identical or similar material at no additional charge in the future. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing.